Hello, everybody. Good evening. I'm delighted that you've been able to join us, quite a few of you, um, for this incredibly important conversation. Just before we started, James, one of our guests, was saying that The Guardian has just reported that the Amazon is now, that is the Amazon rainforest, is now releasing more carbon than it's absorbing. With the note that that is probably more from fires than from the whole place turning from a carbon sink into a carbon source. Nonetheless, yet another reminder if one were needed this very hot summer of how urgent all these issues are. So the, the question is, what does net zero really mean? And I'm especially pleased that we are addressing it because for the last couple of months, I feel I've been walking a tightrope without a safety net uh, on this issue, which we've been uh, discussing a lot within Tortoise and at Tortoise Thinkings uh, with members and guests. Why? Because a couple of months ago, I, I lose track, but I think it's a couple of months ago, we, or earlier this year, we hosted um, uh, with uh, Cap Gemini, among others, and Cap Gemini is um, our partner this, uh, this evening, a, a climate summit in which one of our guests, Tom Rivet Karnak, gave uh, an impassioned defense of the concept of net zero. Uh, why? Because on the one hand, it was under attack, not from climate deniers, but from activists and experts, including one who's with us this evening. We'll hear more about that. Uh, but on the other hand, he had personal experience as one of the key figures at the uh, 2015 Paris Climate Conference of net zero as a, an organizing principle. A, a, what, what my colleague Katie Vanek Smith would call a call to action, a, uh, an easily expressed galvanizing idea that got pledges from participating delegations and countries where um, uh, the uh, previous um, uh, conferences had, had failed. Um, so I think it's extremely important that, that we know what we're talking about here, and not least because we at Tortoise have assembled an accelerating net zero coalition because we want to do our bit and we want to help our partners do their bit, everyone collectively in, in reaching that goal. Um, but in any case, Tom Rivet Karnak's sort of plea for net zero as a concept stuck with me. And I hope that we can at least begin this hour to be clear about what the phrase does and doesn't mean, um, whether it is useful as a call to action or just a polluter's charter, to be clear about what it entails in terms of action to get there, and uh, to be clear about what it might mean uh, if one did get there. And that is, that is the futurology bit of the discussion, which I do hope we will make time for towards the end of the hour, because I think there's some interesting um, atmospheric chemistry, apart from anything else, that we, that we need to understand. Uh, very briefly, housekeeping rules. Uh, this is a think-in. Uh, many of you have been to one before, but just in case you haven't, the main point is to hear from as many people as possible, uh, to hear your views, uh, and for us at Tortoise to harvest your story ideas, quite bluntly, uh, so that we can turn them into, into stories and investigate them uh, further. You can do that by chatting, uh, by typing in the chat. And please do that right away, because quite often what happens is we sort of go into passive mode and listen to begin with, and then suddenly the chat fills up in the second half hour and we don't have time to, to get to you, uh, because quite often we, we would like to hear more from people who say interesting things in the chat. And of course, you can raise your electronic hand, um, and I must be sure to click on participants so that I can see if anyone's doing that. That is now done. Okay, so we are joined without further ado by Emma Watson, who is Senior Manager for Net Zero um, at the Science-Based Targets Initiative at the Carbon Drawdown Project. I think there may have been one or two too many acts there, but I think that's roughly it. Uh, <laughs> by Dr. James Roby, who is Global Head of Environmental Sustainability at Capgemini, and by Professor Sir Robert Watson, who, among many other things, is a former chief scientist at DEFRA, uh, former chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity Ecosystem Services, and pertinently is um, a lead author, was a lead author of 
making peace with nature, the UN sponsored report released, I think in February this year. Um, I'd, I'd like to start please by coming to you, Emma. As I understand it, what you're working on specifically now is um, a corporate net zero standard for the science-based targets initiative. And perhaps you could tell us I mean, maybe it's in development, but tell us what that standard involves, because I'm hoping it might help us begin to get at a definition of net zero. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Giles. Um, yeah, and great to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, so so I work at the Science Based Targets Initiative. Um, we're an NGO. We were formed um, in 2015, just before the Paris Climate Talks. Um, and essentially what we do is we help companies align their emission reduction targets with um, the Paris Agreement. So really helping translate that kind of temperature goal of well below two degrees into something meaningful for, for companies. So that's really been our focus for the last kind of um, five years. But recently, obviously, there's been a huge surge in, in net zero commitment and everyone's really interested in what net zero means. And because of that, companies are kind of, you know, setting net zero targets, but they don't really have anything to look at, anything to fall back on. So essentially what we've been trying to do is break down what that means for companies. So at the moment, the, the targets that we um, help companies set are kind of five to 15 year time horizons. Whereas with net zero, we're typically looking a bit further into the future. So we've there's lots of companies um including capgemini that have science-based targets at the moment and that's kind of really the first step but i think what has become the main focus of net zero is really the kind of net part and really what we need to be looking at is the further reduction that um companies and countries need to be making so that's really what we're focusing on at the moment is, you know, over the long term, how much do companies need to decarbonize and at what rate and what pace and what essentially. When you say the net part of it, are you referring, let's let's use the journalistic shorthand to offsets broadly defined? Yes. Yeah. So there's been a lot of focus, I think, on on offsetting um, when really when you look at, you know, the global climate scenarios, we need to be decarbonizing about 90 percent to reach global net zero. So we're trying to help companies find that pathway in the first instance, as well as give some guidance on how to kind of offset. But really, our main priority is that first piece of decarbonization. So let me understand that. Uh, let's take a generic company. If you if you can give an example, so much the better. But do do you first of all is your work for companies bespoke, and second of all, uh, are you is your ideal sort of package of of guidelines ninety percent decarbonisation and ten percent offsets? So the work is not necessarily bespoke. So what we're trying to do, I guess, is provide some global guidance that would apply to most companies at the moment we're not really focused on the financial sector we've got another completely separate project to do that because it's a bit more complicated but kind of all companies apart from the financial sector is what we're looking at and then within that we're then breaking it down to kind of sector levels and for some of the sectors that are perhaps more important um in the decarbonization journey so it's not necessarily bespoke but what happens is once we release the guidance and the standard, we will then eventually start verifying targets in 2022, January 2022. So companies will go away, they'll kind of do their homework, set their targets, they'll send it to us, and then we will make sure that they're doing the right thing, essentially. So it's not bespoke to begin with, but then we do make sure that they're doing the right thing at the end. So you will undertake to verify targets. Are you also in the certification of offsets business? No, we're not. Um, we're not part of part of that. Um, and it's kind of we're looking at, you know, how we can perhaps incentivize climate finance, whether that be through offsetting or perhaps more kind of innovative um, ways of incentivizing climate finance. But at the moment, we're looking we'll definitely be looking at how companies are decarbonizing. And then 
we may, you know, start looking at how companies are offsetting, but um, that kind of remains to be seen and is not the first priority for us at the moment. And um, Emma, I, I don't know if, if you get this question from companies that you work with, but you must get it. Uh, how do you respond to people who say that the concept of net zero is a, um, an encouragement to burn now, pay later thinking? Um, well, I mean, I guess what we're trying to do with the standard is essentially solve that problem. So we've seen that there is, you know, that kind of get out of jail free card type of um, action that's going on with current net zero targets. And so we're trying to step in and make sure that although it's kind of a an exciting concept that people are still doing the right thing um, when it comes down to looking at the nuts and bolts of how they're actually decarbonizing. So hopefully once there's a bit of standardization, um, we can start to solve that problem, but um, perhaps that's quite an optimistic point of view. <laughs> but Okay, so just one last thing while, while we're on that. Surely to solve that get out of jail free problem, uh, the conversation is always a difficult one with companies because you're proposing sort of given a choice, the more expensive and more disruptive of all the options available. Is that right? I guess it could be, but there is, you know, I guess if a company is looking at it and looking at their whole strategy, you know, over time, is it really, you know, the best option for the company to be offsetting now? Is that, you know, there's a whole lot of climate related risks that come with that. And they may think that it's, you know, the cheapest, easiest option for now, but that's probably them not really looking into the future and right. thinking about, you know, what are the impacts that could come in five, 10 years if we don't actually start taking it seriously. All right. That's very helpful. Okay, thank you, Emma. So from the general to the specific, let's come to James, Dr. James Roby at Cat Gemini. Um, you've been responsible, I think, for some time for your company's uh, climate and, and specifically net zero policies. Um, uh, and I, th I think you have a 10 year plan. Can you t t tell us, first of all, what you understand by the term and, and, and what you're trying to do to make it happen? Absolutely. So just building on uh, a lot of the things that Emma Emma said, uh, for me, the first thing about net zero, you have to start with reduction. It has to be reduced first and then compensate later. Uh, and for us, I suppose there's almost a three point, um, three point journey in terms of uh, net zero. And um, so the first is that reduction targets. And for us, we've taken the view that those targets have to be in line with one and a half degrees uh, climate science. So we've validated it. We've had our targets verified by SBTI at the, the one and a half degree level. Um, you can have them uh, verified at a slightly softer level, but we've gone for the, the one and a half degree level. So that's step one. Um, I think then step two is the critical one, and that's going to be the, the next um, 10 years of journey for us is you've got to deliver your targets. Um, and that's probably going to be the hardest part in terms of actually driving down the carbon um, that, we're, that we're producing and that others are producing. And then step three is the compensation piece. Step three is if you have residual emissions, which the majority of businesses will have some form of emissions, which they're going to find difficult to, to get to zero, then you have to look at compensation or offsets. Uh, and we're looking at offsets which specifically remove the carbon from the atmosphere. So that's the sort of three step journey, Giles, in terms of the, the way we're thinking about it. And uh, since you've mentioned those offsets, and I'm sure we can come back to this, um, do you... What, what, what is the gold standard in the world at the moment? Because there's endless discussion um, and there seems to be a spectrum of, of what uh, offsets where the, the greenwash criticism is valid and offsets where everyone involved really is doing their best to bury or sequester carbon for good. Where are you going for this? So um, ultimately, in terms of our net zero target, we've said that um, we're taking the view that um, the compensation has to be through carbon removal. So they have to be uh, offsets which are physically removing the carbon as opposed to reducing somebody else's carbon. And at the moment, that the majority of that means nature based solutions. So trees or mangrove swamps or potentially soils. Um, it's there are evolving standards in terms of you know, what counts as a carbon offset. And then the, the new player on the block is, is sort of the, the engineering type of sort of uh, physical carbon removal from the atmosphere. Uh, the reality at the moment is that is 
are very expensive compared to nature-based solutions. Um, we suspect that you know the you know, hopefully innovation will come and that will become more affordable in in the future. But the underlying philosophy is we've got to get the carbon out of the atmosphere. So so we think um, at the moment, and and it may change over time, but we think that you know that net zero commitment comes from from actually physically removing the the, the same amount of carbon that we are uh, that we're putting into the atmosphere. And the other thing I didn't mention before, um, Giles, which we have a sort of strong conviction on. Is, is around transparency. Mm -hmm. So um, we have tried to be as explicit as possible in terms of our targets, what we're including, what we're excluding, um, so that you know, if people want to have a conversation, they want to, to um, challenge us in terms of where we're going, they can do that from a, from a position of having a, a, a full picture of, of what we're trying to achieve as a business. Okay. Uh, James, you're obviously aware broadly of, of, the, of the debate about the merits of net zero as a concept. Um, in, in the world that you inhabit, um, does the concept ever make you uncomfortable? Slash, is there an alternative approach to, to decarbonizing for, for, for a business? So, so, so I'm thinking not just of you, but of your clients as well, because consulting is your business. So I think that the first thing is that, you know, while we're talking about net zero, Behind this is an absolute level of, of, um, of carbon or an absolute level of greenhouse gas concentration that we can, we can cope with in, in the atmosphere. It's quite an interesting report that came out in the last couple of days from MSDI. Um, and they were looking at, you know, based on the, the, the world's listed, largest listed companies, how many more years at the current rate of uh, um, carbon emissions can we actually get through before we, before we bust the targets? And they're saying about five years, eight months in terms of two, two, um, one and a half degree targets. So ultimately, there is a physical amount of carbon that we can we can put or greenhouse gases that we can put in the atmosphere before we are going to breach the one and a half degree um, climate um, climate uh, boundaries set by the, the Paris Agreement. I think the challenge is um, when you bring that back to a business, how do you how do you figure out what your share of that um, that remaining carbon budget is? And I, I think it's a um, a couple of hundred, um, somewhere between two and 300 gigatons more of carbon we can put into the atmosphere. And I, and I suppose from our perspective, the way we get around that, and I think the way that people need to, to rely on things like the, uh, the Science-Based Targets Initiative is actually working with somebody who's done the, the mathematics, they've applied the science and said, actually for your organization, this is, this, is the, this is the reduction pathway you need to deliver to ensure that you know, your organization is within that overall absolute amount of carbon that we can that we can put into the atmosphere. I think the other thing which fits in there sort of thinking slightly longer term is is some of the work which is coming out of some of the organizations like Project Drawdown, which is actually recognizing that yes, we need to get to net zero, but actually getting to net zero still leaves us with a with an atmospheric con concentration of carbon well over 400 parts per million. And ultimately, we need to get that back down. Uh, into the 300s and possibly further if we want to get the, uh, the, the planet back into the, the equilibrium we were previously in. Um, so I think net zero is a, certainly from a business perspective is a helpful concept in terms of that sort of first step in the journey. Okay, thanks. That, that's, that is a, a good way to think of it. Before I come to Robert Watson, which I will do in just one second, I want to come back to Emma very briefly so that I understand uh, about the budget. Do you work in terms of um, an overall carbon budget, which you then divide up between everybody who's going to need a share of it? Is, is that a part of your thinking? So we do have um, one method called the sectoral decarbonisation approach, which companies in some sectors can use. And that is essentially, you know, taking um, each sector is kind of piece of the pie and then assigning a decarbonization rate based on that. Um, and then we also have other methods which just require a company to reduce their emissions on an absolute basis in line with the global trajectories. So it's, it's not as closely linked to kind of the current um, carbon budget. It's based on older scenarios that we have available, um, but we have this concept of forward-looking ambition and um, which we check that companies are making sure that they are looking to the future and not relying on emission reductions in the past to try and um, I suppose ensure, ensure that the emission reductions required are being made. 
So, th so you're encouraging companies to compare their current performance with what is required of them rather than what they have been doing historically. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, all right, this is very interesting. Uh, Professor Watson, let me preface my remarks by apologizing for any howlers that I make. And I should have said that at the top because I'm a, a rank amateur in all this. And forgive me if, if I misquote you or anything, but am I right that you have on the, on the one hand in a widely quoted uh, article with a couple of, of co-authors referred to net zero as a trap and also quite recently been quoted uh, in the Guardian as saying that the UK's net zero by 20 50 target is a wonderful thing. Um, if so, which is it? Oh, it's straightforward. Net zero is actually an interesting concept. We actually need to have our emissions by the middle of this century to be net zero. But what it's meant is that many governments, many in this parts of industry have been focusing on how do I get to net zero by 2045, 2055, rather than ask the key question, how do I reduce my emissions now? If we want to be on a pathway to a 1.5 degree world, we need global emissions to be 45% lower than the 1990 emissions by 2030. All of the current pledges under the Paris Agreement suggest our emissions in 2030 will be the same as today, uh, not 45, 50% lower. Even though a two degree pathway, we need emissions to be lower by 25% by 2030. So I think the trouble is too many governments, too many private sector companies have been focusing on where can I be by the middle of the century rather than the key issue is what can I do today? What can I do in the next three years, five years, 10 years? That's the key issue. And the less we do today, the more we're going to have to rely on unproven technologies by the middle of the century to be negative emission technologies. So do we need net zero? Of course we do. What we're concerned about it's taken the eye off the ball of the real challenge, emissions reductions today. That's very clear. Um, it, it's also clear from talking to businesses <clears throat> that they're terrified of what they call uh, disruption um, because that translates into uh, changes to financial performance, to laying people off, what, what do you have a broad reassurance that you can offer? Not, I mean, let, let, let's compartmentalize the big emitters, big oil and, 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 and the mining companies and that kind of thing. What, 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 what would, would you say to someone in James's position uh, if, if your basic criticism is now, 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 your plan is not urgent enough? Well, the key point is urgency is the key issue. And it could be disruptive, as effectively many of the analyses have shown, there could be short term costs to individual governments, to the private sector, but long term benefits. The cost of inaction, taking no action or limited action is much more expensive to society as a whole than taking action now. Climate change, as we all know, can adversely affect agricultural production, water resources, destroys nature, sea level rise affecting infrastructure, coastal zones. All of these things come at an incredible cost. And therefore the argument, it came from the Nick Stern analysis many years ago, that we can actually save money collectively to society by acting now. We need to produce our energy, obviously fossil free, we need to use our energy much more efficiently, more efficient transportation, buildings, industry. Uh, obviously, we mustn't forget the other greenhouse gases of methane, nitrous oxide. This means significant changes in our agricultural sector, our forestry sector. And so, yes, there will be some disruptions, but it's quite clear that there will be lots of jobs produced 
uh, by get moving to renewable energy technologies, trying to make our use of energy much more efficient. So yes, action is needed if we want to realize anything even close to the 1.5 or 2 Celsius. I'm personally completely skeptical that we have any possibility of a 1.5 world. And I'm even concerned we won't get a two degree world. Action is needed and action is needed now by all actors. Governments need to set the right policies. They need to, they need to work with the private sector to get the policies, the legislation in place. It needs cooperation between government, the private sector, the NGOs, financial institutions need to play a very critical role in this. So the bottom line is very simply, net zero is absolutely where we need to get, but to make, we need to minimize our reliance on potentially unproven technologies or technologies like large scale afforestation or monoculture biology, which we know is not good for biodiversity, food and water security. Um, in your, uh, yes, James, I see your hand and we'll, uh, I'll give you a chance to come back on this in just a second. In your report, your most, your more recent one, you said that we were heading for what temperature at current levels of emissions? With the current pledges under Paris, and of course, governments have made some recent pledges is when they met with Biden and the European Union yesterday came up with an action plan, which I have not read in detail, only saw it on the BBC News today. Um, effectively, with the pledges under Paris, we're likely to pass 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, somewhere in the 2030s, past two degrees Celsius in the 2060s, and we're currently on a pathway of three to four degrees Celsius by 2100, well above, well above uh, the Paris targets. We need very, very stringent reductions in emissions to get anywhere close to the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Let, let's come back to, to James. And then if possible, I'd like to come to Adam. You're, you're in the chat as Adam one, because I think you raise a really interesting point that people will be keen to discuss why the government can't simply legislate. Um, but James. Yeah, I was just gonna come back and totally agreeing with uh, what Robert says. I think from our perspective, um, this, this whole, um, we need to be net zero as a planet by 2050, means that businesses then need to look at themselves and look at their opportunities and really push the boundaries harder. That's why we went in and said, you know, our contribution, our sector, we're not, um, we're not heavy industry, we're not um, reliant on huge amounts of fossil fuel, therefore we want to be net zero by 2030. Um, and, and, you know, I'd encourage, you know, businesses, if there's one thing you can do, I guess it's to try and bring that, that year forward as, as much as possible. So, you know, as, as Robert said, um, Every, every ton of carbon emissions saved this year is another ton of, of abatement or reduction or removal that we're going to not have to find in the future. Um, I think um, the point about radical transformation is absolutely right. We wrote a report just in the run up to um, the last COP25 um, in, in Madrid, looking at what was needed in terms of that, that business revolution. And I think, you know, maybe, that, maybe we need to be talking in that sort of language about radical transformation, about business revolution in terms of really rethinking quite radically how we're, um, how we're, how we're, um, how we're organized, how we're delivering the, the products and services that our customers are, are taking for granted. James, while we're, while we're on that, I mean, can you itemize uh, what a radical transformation would look like if, if you, were stuck in a boardroom with a client that said, we want to do this. What would be your steps one, two, and three when you leave the room, first, first pieces of action? So there's, there's lots of different ways of doing it. I think one of the ways of doing it is to challenge organizations in terms of what are they really trying to deliver? What's the underlying product or service that they're trying to deliver? Um, I, had a, I went to a fascinating meeting, this is quite a few years ago now, with the, um, uh, the head of then British Airways. And somebody asked him what was his biggest regret in the last 12 months. And he talked about the fact that he tried to buy a video conferencing company and the, and the board wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't budge and they wouldn't let him make the acquisition. 
And his rationale was really interesting. He said that, you know, the core of his profit was coming out of transporting business people around the world to have business meetings. Not much profit made in the back of the plane. It's all in the front of the plane. Now, if you if you put a carbon model on there, you suddenly find that if you're going to price carbon at the types of level that we need to price carbon, it's not necessarily going to be economic to fly large numbers of people around the world. Interestingly, COVID's kind of done that you know, if through, through a different mechanism over the last 12 months. So what he was saying was, well, actually, what's the heart of the business um, connecting business people? How do you do it? Well, if you can't do it by putting them in thin aluminium tubes and, and, and flying them around the world, you need to find an alternative method. And so you could argue he was sort of 10 years ahead of the game, thinking about, you know, um, redesigning his, his business model in a different way. So there's lots of ways of doing it, Giles, but that would probably be the starting point uh, because so much of what we do is hugely wasteful. You know, if you think about taking a car journey from, you know, getting in your car and maybe driving from London to Birmingham, you're, you're probably 70 or 80 kilos, but you're quite happily using the, the fossil fuel to shift 1500 kilos of car from A to B so that what you really want to do is transport 80 kilos or 70 kilos of you from A to B. So that's the sort of radical thinking you need to go through in terms of, okay. you know, think about the underlying product or service you're trying to deliver to your clients. That is fascinating. And just while we're on that, um, uh, just to be clear, you're saying the the head of BA or, or the, the holding company IAG was was actually prevented from buying this video conferencing company? Yeah, it was a long time ago. I mean, we're oh, probably okay. talking 10 years ago now. Okay. But it, it was just a really interesting anecdote that somebody asked him what his, his biggest regret was over the last 12 months. And, and that's what he came up with, which mm. I thought was a really interesting insight into you know, their business model and, and what, what, the, what the underlying value that they're creating as, a, as an organization. And, yeah, and I mean, it's the same thing for, for most other organizations. It seems like a very close equivalent of a Shell or a BP trying to switch from um, oil to wind and kind of hesitating about actually doing it for a variety of financial and logistical reasons, um, which are kind of frustrating. Um, is it, uh, okay, we've got a hand up from uh, Neil Ross Russell, but can we come to Adam just quickly first? Uh, yeah, um, I was just asking, just wanted to ask the question why there is a, well, business's primary focus isn't to change society and, you know, it, it's made up of people that might want to improve it, but ultimately it's, it survives on the amount of money that it makes and brings in. If you ask and expect business to lead the transition, it's not going to work because they're not going to do things that will cost them more money, and particularly if it threatens their business model. So you know the the anecdote about the IAG um, British Airways staff um, CEO is is very interesting, but they're still flying. Um, that's still their profit center. So I, I think really the focus should be on governments dictating what can and can't be done. That's what they exist for. They're there to change mm -hmm. society. Do you but think? Yeah, as someone's commented, you know, you need to make it expensive not to do the things that will protect the planet. Right. Which, which may require legislation, is, is your point. Yeah. Um, but do you think that uh, we have yet to reach a political tipping point that makes that politi politically advantageous? I'm always reminded of a speaker at a previous thinking who said um, that in Australia, in the last general election, the, uh, I always get this wrong way around, I think it's the Labour Party, assumed that it, that it might turn out to be a climate ele election, and it just didn't. That whole issue uh, tanked. Um, I mean, do, do you sense that we're, Adam, that we're reaching a point where there's a general notion that we're all frogs in a frying pan and, and that might change next time people go to the um, uh, ballot box? Uh, no, unfortunately. Um, I actually think the opposite. Unfortunately, I've got quite a pessimistic view of what I think the UK and the rest of the world is going to do about climate change. And I think it's going to get extremely bad. And then we will try and do some things that tinker around the edges, but it will be far too late for a far, far too many people to do anything about it. Uh, well, sorry. <laughs> what he said. No, no, no. I, I think that's a, a, a pretty fair assessment the way things are going, isn't it? Um, uh, Neil, you've, you've put your hand up and then uh, Robert will come back to you. Uh, thanks, Charles. Uh, no, I just, it was a, a, a question, I think, probably for James. I mean, I'm interested in.
uh, I think we're all agreeing here that net zero is, is a sort of elegant concept that uh, makes this very complex challenge a, a bit more accessible and um, provides a methodology by which businesses can, can, can measure their current emissions, can reduce their future emissions and ultimately compensate for their, for their past emissions. But given that a company like Capgemini, and I don't want to pick on Capgemini, but because James, because you're here, given that you have, are doing that, are in the process of doing that, what is the logic for setting a future net zero target when you've done all the calculations and you know exactly what your emissions were last year? What is the logic for not being net zero now? So I think for me, the, the logic there is, um, I think there's a danger that if you go for net zero too quickly, what you end up doing is saying, well, we can, the only way we could be net zero tomorrow, if you believe it's a feasible way of doing it, would be to, to, through, through larger levels of, of compensation. And I think there's a real danger that if you make net zero too easy by saying we're just going to buy large, large amounts of uh, offset, then you take your eye off this need to reduce. So, so for me, um, net zero is, is typically something that I would expect to see having somewhere around a 10 year minimum, depending on the, on the industry, but sort of a, a plus or minus 10 year time horizon which gives you a decent length of time to really do what you can in terms of driving down your emissions. Um, we're actually committed as an organization to, to be carbon neutral by, by 2025. So we're actually in the process now of starting to invest in, in carbon offsets um, on that journey. But what we didn't want to do is sort of make a claim um, to be net zero straight away by a load of offsets. To me, that, that feels that there's a danger of greenwash and you actually need to put some sort of stretching reduction targets in line with the climate science first. But surely if, there is, if, you're, if you're paying an annual compensation charge, if we can, if we can call it that, then by dint of the fact that, that that is a very real hit on your bottom line and you've got a very real commercial incentive to reduce that over time. So, so, so it, and as long as you're reliant on, on genuinely gold standard offsets, then the logic dictates that if you've got that and hitting your bottom line, then every year you will strive from a commercial point of view, not just as an environmental point of view, but from a commercial point of view, you've got a very real incentive to reduce that, that, comp that climate compensation charge as fast as you possibly can. And I think you're right. I think just from, from our perspective, um, I suppose it depends whether you call it carbon offset or net zero. What we wanted to do is we wanted to say we wanted to keep that focus on the climate science and actually say we need to deliver those 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 deep cuts over the next five to ten years. Um, yeah, I mean we will we will we will start compensating. We'll get to a point of neutrality, um, but we wanted to have you know a reasonable time frame. And one of the one of the commitments we have is halving the carbon footprint of our supply chain. And we know it's going to take a, a reasonable amount of time to work through the entire su supply chain to work with our suppliers to actually physically reduce those absolute emissions. So, so that's sort of the logic. I mean, I, I'm sure Emma would have a view as, as, as well in terms of, um, you know, what's a reasonable time frame for net zero and, and why aren't we all going sort of straight there straight away? Emma did have her hand up a second ago, but... Um... But she's put it down. So to encourage the raising of hands, I'm going to come first to Robert, who's still got his up. And then uh, uh, is it Zia? I'm, I, forgive me if I've got um, I see your hand, too. But uh, l let's come to James and then Emma and then Zia. I I'm sorry, Robert first. Yes, I mean, I think Adam made an interesting point. Can we expect business to lead? Actually, I've got rather encouraged by business over the last one to two years. If one looks at what the World Economic Forum have been talking about, in each of the last two years, they've highlighted for their businesses, if they're going to be sustainable, the key issues they have to care about are the environment. 18 months ago, the top five threats to business sustainability were all environmental. And obviously, climate change was there. Loss of biodiversity was there. This year, four of the five were all environmental. The fifth one was a pandemic, and they've obviously got sensitized uh, to the potential of future pandemics. And so, there's, I mean, Adam is right. We need government to lead in partnership with the private sector. For example, in many parts of the world, we have perverse uh, fossil fuel subsidies, agriculture subsidies, mining subsidies, um, forestry, fishery subsidies. We need to get rid of these subsidies 
They're perverse. They don't help poor people, and nearly all of them lead to unsustainable uh, energy practices, agricultural practices, fisheries, mining, etc. So, yes, government can play a key role in reforming the economic system, making sure there are the right incentive structures for the private sector, making sure there's a level playing field for the private sector, but I'm actually impressed by some of the multinationals who are really thinking ahead of the game. They want to be ahead of regulations. They want to be first movers to get the right technologies in place to capture the marketplace and to make a profit, as Adam said. I also like what James just said. A company could get seduced into net zero for the company level by buying offsets much more important, as James has just said. Let's think carefully how we can reduce our emissions and be viable as a company. And offsets are only a long-term uh, strategy for those emissions that are very hard to offset, basically. And as I said earlier, many of these offsets, negative emissions technology, large-scale afforestation, large-scale monoculture, bioenergy, they really come with risks to biodiversity in nature and food and water security. The challenge is let's reduce our emissions now and try not to rely too much on these so-called negative emission technologies in the middle of the century. Uh, thank you, Robert. Emma, did you want to jump back in before we go to Zia? I think um, they both said it really, really well, so I don't know how much more I have to add, but I guess just the point being that, um, you know, companies can't credibly claim to be net zero tomorrow because they're going to have to reduce their emissions by around 90% in order to do so. And um, you have to focus on decarbonisation. And unfortunately, there's not much evidence to show that putting a price um, on carbon by offsetting makes much difference to a company and their mitigation strategies. So, um, yeah, it, it's unfortunate that we can't be all net zero tomorrow, but there is that level of deep decarbonisation that we have to reach first. OK, fair enough. So the point is that we are where we are and you cannot simply decarbonise by 90 percent overnight. Understood. Uh, Zia and then Richard Whitaker, I see your hand up, too. Good morning. Uh, so to, to bring you a different perspective, since I'm across the pond and piggybacking on what Adam and Robert were talking about, government. So in California, we have a, a recall election. And one of the people who's running against our Democratic governor is Caitlyn Jenner, who I'm sure some of you have heard about. And she's running on a platform of business first because climate change really doesn't exist. So I don't wanna be doomsday, but I do feel that if we're waiting for government to solve all of these issues, because things are so polarized right now with the conservative side that climate change still doesn't exist, we're fighting this huge uphill battle that needs more than just government regulation because they may not happen. Even in California, which is where I live, we had a solar mandate with all new construction. Woo, this is awesome. And then it's been battled back by lobbyists, battled back by Republicans, to the point where the solar initiative barely gives enough energy to maybe run a coffee pot in a new house. So I do see a huge challenge getting certain governments on board at this time, simply because climate change has been politicized. Sia, I'm very excited that you've joined us from California, <laughs> uh, where I used to live. I, um, we were just talking about uh, tipping points. Uh, I was thinking particularly in terms of public awareness. It's really hot from what we hear right now in California, as it was a couple of weeks ago in the Pacific Northwest. Is, is there any evidence of that changing views? Absolutely. I, I think one of the problems we're having is when you talk to the regular American, 70% or more are like, oh my God, we, we need to do things. We need to have change. We need to get on board. But right now, 
government isn't necessarily speaking for the people. Mm -hmm. Yes, we've got Biden and we've got so many great people, but we also know this is all temporary. And just, you know, my district is currently being redistricted so that our Democratic um, leader for my area, which is Katie Porter, if you ever get the chance to watch her do, she's kind of amazing. But the whole redistricting is to get rid of her so that they can get a Republican in to stop some of these things that are happening. That, that's so federal think, redistricting, is it? Um, it's for Orange County. So it is a county redistricting for District 45. So I think the people are on board. Um, they know what's happening. I think they recognize things. I, I'm seeing a lot more when, when you start to search for things like composting, food waste, energy use, so many people have questions. How do I get on board? How do I do this? How do I become part of this? But the infrastructure and the systems aren't necessarily in place to get everybody in there. So I, I kind of feel we're a little discombobulated right now between mm -hmm. what the people want and what's happening in government. That's, that's a really good point. Um, and yeah, of, of course, at, at the federal level, uh, Biden's freedom to act depends on a very fragile and uh, temperamental one vote majority in, in the Senate. Um, uh, Richard, what's on your mind? Um, I wanted to just come back on this uh, idea of uh, the carbon offsets and carbon credits. Now, I completely understand the, the logic here that the priority has to be decarbonization, it has to be reduction. We can't be still putting out as much carbon as we're putting out right now. But it seems to me that there's there's a really strong argument for saying that we need to keep this idea of carbon credits and carbon offsets really quite at the front of our minds as well. We've been talking here about net zero. We, I think we all accept that it is not feasible to get to a place where kind of human activity doesn't emit any carbon into the atmosphere. So there's going to have to be some form of offsetting, right? And 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 Robert was talking about it. You know, some of this stuff is dependent on technology that we haven't it, haven't even invented yet. Now, what what? How do you get to technology you haven't invented yet? You need to invest in it. You start investing in it now if you want it in 10, 15, 20 years time. If you, you know, talk to people in the like uh, shipping industry and things like that, they're effectively saying they're having to build ships now for to, to operate in 2050. So what do they do? They need to start trying to make the technology work. In, and if we if we if we're essentially kind of sort of saying, well, no, we can't prioritize carbon credits, we can't prioritize carbon offsetting, that is effectively saying we can't prioritize putting the investment now into things like CCUS. Now, if you talk to the IEA, they will tell you that has to be a part of the decarbonization strategy for, for energy. Um, if we're not putting the energy, pardon the pun, into this now and, and, the, and the investment into it now by prioritizing it, by recognizing it's going to have to be part of the solution, then aren't we missing something? That's a great question. Let me, let me put it back to you, uh, Robert. Um, surely, uh, offsets have to be more than a last resort. Yes, no, nat yeah, I want to be clear on this. Nature-based solutions can play a role. Um, it can even potentially play an important role. Uh, some estimates have suggested that one third of the uh, emissions reductions we need could come from carbon-based offsets, but we have to make sure they're the right sort. Reforesting degraded forests with native species makes sense. Be good for carbon, be good for biodiversity. But if we use exotic species, that could be good for carbon, but really bad for biodiversity. Large scale afforestation, uh, likely to be adverse for biodiversity. Uh, large scale bioenergy, using monocultures, if it requires cutting down native vegetation, forest, grassland, again, bad for biodiversity. So nature-based solutions, restoration, conservation of what we've got now, very important, but we have to make sure that it's a win-win for climate and biodiversity, and hopefully for other issues like food, water security, human health, uh, poverty alleviation, good livelihoods. And we have to make sure that we don't get unintended consequences. So I'm very positive about nature-based solutions if addressed appropriately by taking a holistic view of whether the intervention is positive from a multitude of reasons, 
and it doesn't have unintended consequences. So, but, yes, Robert, can it I just, will play a role. Can, I think what Rick, uh, Richard was really asking about is what about non-nature-based solutions? I've, I've been very sceptical yeah. in previous thinkings about CCS, but let's play devil's advocate now. Even though nobody has... Uh, scale that up on a commercial basis purely for the purpose of sequestering carbon. As R Richard said, the IEA uh, prospectus depends on it. Lots of big emitters prospectuses depend on it. Uh, and you've got uh, John Kerry, the US climate envoy, talking about uninvented technologies. Um, I mean, is, is there not a point where we are going to have to find a way to extract brute quantities of CO2 from the atmosphere in a, in a way that is quicker and bigger than has ever been done before? Not if we start reducing significantly our emissions today, get out of fossil fuels, use more renewable energy, use our energy more efficiently. The less we do now, the more we're going to have to depend on uninvented technologies or technologies that could have adverse effects. The challenge is action now. Uh, all of these large scale geoengineering putting aerosols in the stratosphere to it reflect incoming solar radiation. I have to say that while I think we should do more theoretical research on it, I'm really worried that we don't understand the consequences of trying to change the Earth's radiative balance. It might call the Earth's surface, but it could be huge regional changes. It could affect the patterns of the monsoon. Some areas might not actually get cooler. They might even get hotter. Precipitation patterns could change. So to rely on technologies that have not yet been invented when we know what we can do today seems really foolhardy to me. Should we keep doing research on all forms of carbon capture? Absolutely. Should we do research on geoengineering as a real backstop? Yes, but let's at least do what we can do now and not rely on these technologies. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, Richard, I note your question in the chat. We're running out of time. I want to come to Eddie Canforth, who's been very patient, and back to James before we finish, and Emma, if you want to have a final word. But mm. Eddie, what's on your mind? Well, you've, you've talked a couple of times about um, political tipping points. My question is about physical tipping points. Currently, there is a huge fire in Siberia, 800,000 acres um, are, are burning. Um, do we know whether or not we have reached some kind of tipping point where these systems are actually going to, to produce more CO2 that we can possibly draw down within a, um, a reasonable time scale, especially as various of these um, ecosystems will struggle to recover? Um, so, you know, the clock is obviously ticking. Where do we think we are on the clock? Well, we're going to have to come back to Robert very briefly on that, if I may. Is there a physical tip tipping point in Siberia? Uh, and while we're about it, Robert, just on atmospheric chemistry, my question at the top, let's suppose we got to net zero. Do see atmospheric CO2 levels then gradually come down automatically as a result of the carbon cycle? Um. No, the answer is no to that last question. We would have to have negative emission technologies uh, more than offsetting any residual emissions for the concentrations to come down. We're probably getting closer to what I prefer to call thresholds and tipping points. If we start to, con if we continue to see these really high temperatures that we've seen recently on the west coast of the USA, up into Canada and in Siberia, then one of the real threats is a massive melting of permafrost, releasing more methane into the atmosphere, causing more, uh, I don't like to use the word runaway effect, but certainly amplifying uh, uh, climate change. So we are clearly getting close to tipping points of the loss of Greenland ice sheet, the loss of the West Antarctic ice sheet, permafrost, potentially a change in ocean circulation. We're not there yet but we are getting closer and closer. Thank you. Um, just before we come to James, Karthik, can we come to you? You've had your hand up. Yeah, uh, so basically I was, I was, I was asking, uh, so from a practitioner's perspective, when, when you're trying to implement uh, any change, uh, what banks often um, have a problem is, is that 
they're not able to uh, they're not able to uh, un understand which regulator to follow or which uh, uh, or which which standard to follow for example hkx has a different standard um, and maybe uh, uh, the tcfd is a different standard or different set of regulations there's so many accounting uh, accounting bodies which have different methods to calculate carbon emissions so uh, how does a bank choose which is the right standard to follow that's a really interesting question a lot of work's being done on it maybe is that something you could touch on in in, in uh, uh, your last bite at the cherry james I, oh, I can try. Um, it, it's not really my... Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I think... Yeah, you can. Sorry, yeah. I'm yeah. not sure there was off mute. Um, I, can, I can try. I mean, I think banks... It, um, it's not really my area of expertise, but I think banks have got a lot of work to do in this space in terms of thinking about the, the, the lending that they're doing and the financing that they're doing. Um, I suppose what I was going to do was I was going to say, it, you know, somebody put in the chat, um, an hour is clearly not enough to do this 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 just justice. There are so many places we could we could have gone um, just to pick up two or three things very quickly. Somebody mentioned businesses and governments, and I'll put in the chat in a second an example of uh, businesses coming together to um, try to to send letters to to governments and the EU requesting that the the governments do more to set the frameworks we need. Um, I think there's another theme in there that we've talked about, or we've danced around a bit, which is around the, the business case for action. And, and I think it is really important that businesses do spend the time working out the business case for, for action. And, and, and it is there. Um, I did some research with Henley Business School on that, and it, and it can be quite clearly made. And then finally, I think you know, we could very easily do a thinking on going beyond net zero. Um, you know, and that that piece, you know, how do we, you know, we can't, we shouldn't be aspiring to leave carbon emission, carbon levels at the the, the 420 parts per million, we should be thinking about driving it down. And just to just to reiterate, and I'll put the link in in a second for you, Project Drawdown, if you've not had a look at it, have a, have a look at it and they, they do some interesting scenarios. And it's not all about new technologies. You know, the biggest single thing they talk about is actually in the short term, if we reduce food waste and about a third of food which leaves the farm gate never makes it to the plate, that would make an enormous difference to the size of the challenge that we have. So uh, a few a few thoughts there, Giles, to to finish on. Brilliant. And um, Emma, just uh, uh, I'll give you the, the the final word. Have you noticed in companies that you deal with uh, a sort of a genuine change, a sea change in attitudes to this issue, including whether it's compartmentalized as a sustainability issue or whether it's front and center in, in corporate thinking? Because this is something that people talk about quite a lot. Is it something you've noticed? Yeah, huge amount. I mean, I guess that's why we are working on the standard. I think, to be honest, although I'm working on developing the net zero standard, the most important part of the puzzle is, you know, what we do in the next eight and a half years. We have to, you know, half our emissions. But there has been such a surge in people talking about net zero that, you know, we have to we have to do something about it. And we have to get it. We have to get it right. Um, so yeah, there's been a massive change there. Thank you very much, Emma. That is a relatively um, optimistic note on which to end. I was hoping Robert was going to say, "Hey, it's okay, guys. When we get to net zero, levels automatically fall." Uh, I was obviously wrong about that. Uh, James is obviously right that we need to talk about what happens next and how to get to net negative and how to bring that carbon parts per million down below 400 again. I still live in hope that my children and grandchildren will live to see glaciers get longer rather than shorter. Um, I'm really sorry, Caroline Johnston, please join us for future climate thinkings because I wanted to come to you not least about the Subaru philosophy of continuous improvement. Um, I, I was interested that uh, Robert had been encouraged rather than discouraged by business and, and mention of, of the priorities set out by the WB, WEF. Uh, thank you, Zia, for dialing in from California to make the point that while clearly we need governments to lead, you cannot necessarily trust governments, including democratic governments, in very, very clearly warming places to, to provide that leadership. I could go on, but instead of doing that, I will just uh, close by saying, first of all, thank you to Emma, uh, Robert, and uh, uh, James.
uh, and to remind you that this is part of a series. So anything we didn't get to today, I promise we will have an opportunity in a series of accelerating net zero thinking. And by the way, thank you, Robert, for broadly endorsing the concept, even though there is clearly debate about it. So that, that series of thinkings will go up to a COP, at COP and beyond. We're gonna be at COP, we're gonna have them uh, every day at COP. So, and you have to be in Glasgow to, uh, to join us, but we will be there. So once again, thank you all very much. I'm sorry those of you we couldn't get to, but um, we will stick at this. Have a very good evening.